this computer. Okay. All right. So again, this is the webinar overview of essential assessments for students with visual impairments. And our objective for this webinar series is to provide teachers of students with visual impairments and program supervisors information regarding those essential assessments, which are functional vision assessment, learning media assessment, expanded core competency assessment, as well as orientation and mobility screening or assessments, depending on the situation. So if you are looking for in-service credit, we do offer ACV or UP and um, credit that you can obtain through your district for your certification renewal. The opening code that you want to take note of if you're looking for this credit is HIGH, H-I-G-H. -I -G -H. So we will let you know at the end of the webinar how to get that credit. So I'll type that in the chat. Opening code is HIGH. All right, and so with this, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry, and she will get us started on the assessment process. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Liz. Welcome, everybody. Happy 2022. Can't believe that we are in 2022, um, but you've made it through the half of the year so far, so there's a positive. Uh, this is jam-packed, so we're going to keep moving. I am not monitoring the chat box because I... Um, do get distracted by it and then I lose my train of thought, but Liz is keeping track of all your questions. Like she said, don't forget to put them in there as you think of them so you don't forget and we will review them if I haven't answered it during the process. Okay, so here we go, the assessment process. So what does IEDA say about the assessment process? The child is assessed in all areas related to suspected disability, including, if appropriate, health, vision, hearing, social and emotional status, general intelligence, academic performance, communicative status, and motor abilities. In evaluating each child with a disability, the evaluation is sufficiently comprehensive to identify all of the child's special education and related services whether or not commonly linked with the disability category in which the child has been classified. It goes on to say that we must use a variety of assessment tools and strategies to gather relevant functional, developmental, and academic information about the child, including information provided by the parent. Those assessment tools and strategies that provide relevant information that directly assist persons in determining the educational needs of the child are provided. And interpreting evaluation data requires each public agency to draw upon information from a variety of sources, including aptitude and achievement tests, teacher recommendations, as well as information regarding a child's physical condition, social or cultural background, and adaptive behaviors. So for us, as teachers of the visually impaired, those, those assessments are included within our FVMLAs, our Functional Vision Learning Media Assessments. And the components of those include the Functional Vision Assessment, the Learning Media Assessment, Expanded Core Curriculum Assessment, and the orientation and mobility screening or assessment. We are required to do them every three years. We are not allowed to defer them and say we have enough data and continue. We are required to do a complete and full reevaluation at least every three years, if not sooner. And we are also required to consider current and future needs of all of our students. So, we are going to dive deep into the FEMLA today. Let's start with applying IDEA to our FEMLAs. First off, they need to be comprehensive. We need to use a variety of instruments. We cannot rely on just one piece of data. We need to include functional, academic, and developmental information. 
Parents, students, and classroom teachers should provide input. We need to complete observations. Use technically sound instruments. These instruments need to be valid and conducted with fidelity. Instruction in Braille is clearly considered with data and functional skills, which for us are the areas of the expanded core curriculum are also considered. FEMLA technically sound instruments are, um, there is a wide variety of them out there, but I have given you um, access to some of them on this page. The FEMLA, the Looking to Learn, and the Essential Tools of the Trade are wonderful resources, and they are all available from our loan library. You can borrow them and access that on our website. The EA rubric is also a wonderful tool that you can use. It is um, divided into sections by age, which I have always found to be very helpful. And they even have a multiple disabilities category. Because it is web-based, you always have access to it from anywhere and you can download the pieces that you need. There is a link provided in the web, um, in the PowerPoint if you, uh, download the PowerPoint, you will have access to all of the links within it. I tried to link everything for your ease and convenience. So the initial components of our FEMLAs include a cumulative folder review. You want to look at any screenings, psychological evaluations, academic achievement information, anything that could impact the student and their functional vision. You want to look at interviews and conduct them with parents, teachers, and other school staff if it's appropriate, and the student. If the student is verbal, then they should be included in the interview process. Observations. You need to do at least three of them in different environments. The classroom setting was always the first one that I did, and then I used to love to do the playground, um, PE, such valuable information. Cafeteria, can they navigate without running into things? And finally, you want to take into account work samples. This is actual data from the student and can be invaluable. So we're gonna take each of the components of the FEMLA and break them down. We're gonna start with the functional vision assessments. So the purpose of the functional vision assessment is to determine what a child sees by documenting responses to their visual environment. You want to evaluate the range of a child's vision across environments to identify factors that influence vision. And it also provides a basis for instruction and accommodations that that student may need to be successful in the classroom and in life. A well-known former teacher in the state of Florida, Beth Langley, defines the functional vision assessment as the way to determine what enhances visual functioning and what impedes visual functioning. And I love that definition. So the FEA it is made up of formal and informal pieces, the formal assessments which require the administration of standardized procedures in a controlled setting help to confirm the visual acuity recorded in the clinical records and sometimes assessment instruments can be chosen that are more appropriate for a child's developmental level than those used in a clinical setting. I believe we have all had students whose eye medicals do not reflect what we see in the actual school setting. The doctor's office is often an unfamiliar environment. They may be shy or scared by the white coat and unknown person that is suddenly asking them questions. This can affect and skew the eye medical results. We generally know the students much better or have built a rapport with them prior to the functional vision assessment. This helps us obtain the most accurate information on how each student uses their vision on a daily basis. 
the functional vision sequence. The order in which you assess the functional vision can be important. Information in the first few steps can affect the chosen items and how you present them in the other areas. If you conduct the peripheral fields test first and determine that the student has a field loss, you would know exactly where to present items on the subsequent areas. If you find the student has color deficiencies, you would take that into account during other sections of the functional vision assessment. The order I always like to do them in was one, peripheral fields, two, color discrimination, three, developmental perceptual skills, next, near acuities, both formal and informal, distance acuities, once again, both formal and informal, depth perception, and contrast sensitivity. We are gonna dive into each of these areas. Starting with peripheral fields, we're going to watch a short video that gives a really good description on how you can go about assessing a student's peripheral fields. So uh, sometimes when people are doing visual, uh, therapists are looking at visual fields, they'll do a thing where they sit in front of the person and ask them to look for objects. Well, we're not going to do it that way because what they've found is that when you do that, the person is seeing your arms all over the place. So you don't want to have them give away the clues. You really want to get an accurate reading. Um, so we are going to do what's a two-person confrontation test. And so I'm going to stand behind her, but then I will have somebody standing in front of her telling me if she moves her eyes, because I want her to not move her eyes while I do this test. Okay, so I want you to just pick a target that's straight in front of you. I want you to keep your eyes on there and never take your eyes off of that target. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, bring an object into your visual field. I want you to point to it when you see it. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. All right. Uh, so a couple of comments about that. Um, uh, first of all, you've got to uh, have an idea of what her visual fields should be. And visual fields aren't, as we, as we imagine on ourselves, are not a big 180 degree circle. All right. Our, our visual fields are not that far. If you do it on yourself and you go straight out from your eyes, on either side, you have about 95 degrees of visual field. So if you go from the middle, all right, from here out to here, you have just a little bit beyond 90 degrees on either side. That's, that's what you should have. That's about normal, about 95 degrees. And up above, if you look at this level straight up, she should have about 65 degrees. And from underneath, if you bring your your hands in from underneath, you'll see that you have about 75 degrees down below. So that's what I'm expecting her to have. It was a big oval and she responded fine. The last thing I did was the, the two stimuli at once. And so what I'm looking for there, usually people, if you have something like this bright, people will see a red one first before they'll see a blue. But I'm really looking to see how far I have to keep bringing this in before um, they see that there are two targets. And what you'll see, Okay, so that gave us some really good information and some ideas on how to conduct a peripheral field assessment. We're going to go over some of the basic do's and don'ts. Um, she, she was using them, um, doing it by using her hands, and she had on a black sleeves. I would never recommend that because a lot of times the students will see the hands and the arms before they'll actually see the objects and it can skew your results. So an object at the end of a skinny stick or stretched out coat hanger is much better. Um, I always like to use pinwheels from the dollar store because the kids liked them and they were already on a stick for me. And um, so they were just fun for them to find. Uh, it's always best to try and do peripheral fields with two people because uh, younger kids will tend to turn their heads when, they're, when they see it. But if they're older and they're following directions, it's very hard to see when they turn their eyes 
because they've noticed it in their peripheral if you are standing behind them during the test. So if at all possible, two people for this section. Um, if you have a student with CVI or additional disabilities, a moving object like a slinky may alert them sometimes to their peripheral fields. They may not see the stationary objects. However, if you do that, you do want to, to document the stationary and the movement um, in your report. If you are using items that do have movement in them, you want to make sure that they do not make any sound while you're doing it because you want to ensure that you are accurately testing their vision and their fields and not their response to any sort of auditory input. Um, finally, you don't want to report your findings in degrees of field loss. We have no way as TVIs of measuring degrees. Um, some reports that I've seen have said a 20 degree field loss or something like that. There's no way to accurately measure that. What you do want to do is report it in quadrants, such as the left lower quadrant, the way that anyone working with a student will know where to place items within their visual field. Okay, next area, color discrimination. Color discrimination should be done both formally and informally. The good light color test at the top of this page um, works well with all populations because it has both numbers for readers and shapes if they are not reading at this time. Informally, students can name or match colors even just using crayons. Um, in order to see to assess if a student can see colors even before they have the words to name them, they can match bears or other objects to colored paper. I used to find out a lot of times that it wasn't that they had a color deficit, it's that they just couldn't communicate those colored names yet. So that's, if they're not naming them correctly, that was always a go-to for me. So we do have a population that is much more difficult to assess, especially in the area of colors and things like that. So I found a wonderful short video. We're just gonna watch a piece of it from APH on ways that you can assess color discrimination for very young students or students with multiple impairments. So I know this, this little girl right here, when I took this photo, her teacher was having her identify different things on this uh, light box material overlay. Like I know she asked her things like, show me all the blue items in the picture. Show me all the animals in the picture. You know, show me all the vehicles that move in the picture. And then uh, our little, um, little user here on the right, he has different color light box material plexiglass cylinders resting on the ledge. There's a blue one and a green one. He also has a light box material bowl and he has the green one. So his task there is he's he's got the green bowl. So he has to find all the green cylinders and place them in his bowl. So that's using, you know, those hands-on activities. Okay, here are preferred colors, particularly for kids with CVI and stuff. So, you know, start off with a preferred color, gradually add novel colors one at a time until you can build a, a complex um, activity there. You can then use that same one again, you know, point to, point to all the blue triangles or whatever. Okay, color perception, we can match color to picture, choose one color from an array, pair colors to pictures. So again, I've, I've taken the light box uh, materials, picture of the apple, and on the ledge, I have rested a blue cube, a red, a yellow, and a green cube. And so the, the child would have to select the, the color that matches the apple there. On the next one, it's kind of like, okay, we have an apple up and a banana up, and the child is giving two cubes and the child has to place the correct color cube under the, the matching picture. Okay, great suggestions for determining if a child can um, has some color discrimination, even if they don't have the words to tell you. 
Okay, moving along to light sensitivity. The purpose um, for light sensitivity is to determine if a student has visual difficulties that increase with different levels of lighting and or lighting changes. This is like a light to dark adaptation. Some of the materials that you can use are just the environment in itself in a variety of lighting options. Observe them at different times of the day in the classroom because the sunlight will change. Use colored blocks, simple classroom tasks, and even the students' textbooks. Some strategies that you can use when you're observing for light sensitivity is to work on tasks that are meaningful to the student in different areas or lighting within the classroom. How do they do if they sit near the windows? Um, is that lighting too much for them? Do they need to sit away from the windows? What about if the teacher turns the lights or dims the lights because they're projecting something? Are they still able to see the materials in front of them and on the board? Observe the, the students' visual behaviors. Are they squinting? Are they avoiding lights? Are they shading their eyes? Try and note if there's um, an adaptation time when they are coming in from a bright sunny day into a dim corridor. Do they have to stop and wait for their eyes to adjust more so than their sighted peers? What about if they're going outside? Florida is bright and sunny most of the time. You know, do they put a hand up? Do they block their eyes? Do they squint? These can all be signs that they're having difficulty with light sensitivity. Um, some of the ways that you also can test for light sensitivity are the cone adaption test from Vision Associates. There's a picture of it on the left. It is um, just a small container with red, white, and blue squares. Uh, it does cost almost $60. I chose to use red, white, and blue poker chips that I got from the dollar store. Um, I used to keep everything for my functional vision learning media assessments in a bag, and I always had these in there. If the students can sort them um, in, dim circum in dim lighting, that gives you a good idea of um, their light sensitivity. Most students can quickly sort out the white ones, they stand out, but it's much harder to sort the red and the blue ones in dim lighting. Uh, for anyone that has also uh, screened for ushers, this is part of the ushers screening. So I always have these available. We wanna keep in mind that light sensitivity may affect mobility, stamina, comfort, and acuity. This is especially critical for students with albinism and retinal disorders, such as retinitis pigmentosa. An orientation and mobility instructor can access travel, um, can assess travel at night. That's not something I could do. Okay, the next section is developmental perceptual skills. Um, there are a number of them, six, visual discrimination and form perception, figure ground, visual memory, eye-hand coordination, visual closure, and visual se sequencing. We're going to talk about all of these areas, and I'm going to give you ideas on ways to assess them. I do want to let you know that this section is not needed for fluent readers. It should be assessed for students who are pre-readers or struggling readers, because it can give you some really valuable information um, on why they may be struggling with reading. So the first area is visual discrimination and form perception. This is the awareness of distinctive features of forms, including shape, orientation, size, and color. This is an important skill in reading and math. Can the student match, sort objects, shapes, letters, or numbers? Here are some visual discrimination ideas. On the left are cards um, of outer space, fun things for kids, very 
bright visual things. And on each one, they are looking for the object or item that is different. On the right is a different set of cards, bright, dark lined sea creatures. I would have two sets of these printed out and they would have to match them. So they are finding the ones that are the same. The next area would be figure ground. This is the ability to attend to specific feature or form while maintaining an awareness of the relationship of this form to background information. Can they find hidden objects when given pictures in a book or on an electronic device, symbol or real objects? Um, the Where is Waldo books are fun to use for this, uh, but they are very crowded. For younger kids, you may want to use just a regular picture book like the one at the top of this page? Can they point to the sun? Can they find the lollipop? Can they point to the ball? Um, at the bottom of the page is just a black and white worksheet that is great for figure ground. Can they count the number of elephants on the page? Can they point to all of the giraffes? If you're working with a very young student, are they regarding their own hand? Do they respond differently to a familiar face with a background? Um, can they point to at or identify requested items? Next comes visual memory. This is the ability to recognize and recall visually presented information. Spelling requires the recall of visual information. Reading and math require matching the word or number on the page with a stored image. Some of the ways to um, assess this are, can they imitate actions? Can they visually search for missing or hidden items? Do they recognize their name, letters, or numbers? On the right, I've given you a sample of something that you can use. Um, it's a simple worksheet that's remember the shapes. The first, first the students look at the shapes that are on the top, then the top part is covered and can they circle or point to any of the shapes that they remember? Great, easy visual memory. You can also use the cards uh, before um, the sea creatures that you have two sets and you can play that visual matching game and memory game where you turn them over and see if they can find the matches. Kids usually like this uh, section of the assessment because it's fun for them to do. The next section is eye-hand coordination. This is the ability to develop normal internal and external spatial concepts used to interact with and organize the environment make judgments about location of objects and the student's body. You can look for things like, are they able to reach for objects? Can they string beads? Are they coloring within lines? Can they cut out simple shapes? All of these things take eye-hand coordination. The two samples I have on the page on the far left is a tracing shapes activity, and the one on the right is a cutting out of shapes activity. Visual closure is the ability to visualize a complete whole when given incomplete information or a partial picture. This skill helps children read and comprehend quickly. Their eyes don't have to individually process every letter in every word for them to quickly recognize the word by sight. Can they identify or draw missing parts to complete a picture? Some example activities that you can do with them. I have one at the top of the page. It has fun animals and they have to match the head of the animal with the tail of the animal. Another activity you can do are shadow pictures where they have to match the picture of uh, the insect, in this case, a dragonfly with its shadow. If they are older and reading some, then you can check to determine uh, you can use worksheets that have numbers on them with missing pieces and can they match to the correct uh, picture.
The final section in this area is visual sequencing. This is the ability to observe, remember, recall, and reproduce the sequence of objects, symbols, and other things in whatever means appropriate for the students. Um, can they arrange items or pictures in a requested order? One of the uh, suggestions um, that I have on the screen are, can they put, can they sequence pictures? You always want to start off easy and work towards the hard. So I would start with a three sequence first and work towards four or five sequences. Um, this is the last piece in the developmental perception skills section. Remember that this section, um, you only need to assess these skills for students who are not reading. All of the suggestions and samples shown in this section will be available for download within a week on our website. I always had them printed out and stored in baggies so that they were available when I needed them. I kept them in my FVMLA bag um, at all the time so they were on the ready. I know that um, it was my inclination to laminate them so that they would last longer and uh, stay fresh for many uses. However, I decided against that and I would advise you against it because glare from the lamination can affect your results. So um, we're gonna move on with the final pieces in the functional vision assessment. And these are required pieces for all students. And it starts with near acuity and discrimination. You want to start at the normed distance for whatever um, tool you are using, then move closer if necessary. Not all of our students can see any of it from the normed distance. If you do move closer, you want to make sure that you document the actual distance. I always kept a ruler, a tape measure with me so I could measure it out. Um, when I was doing my functional vision assessments in schools, I always tried, I always hoped to do it in a room that had the square tiles because those in a school are always 12 inches, which is a foot. So that made it very, very easy for me to um, assess how far away I was from the student. You always want to, re to start by reviewing any of the shapes that you are using in the assessment. It didn't matter to me what they called them as long as I knew what they called them and that it was consistent. Um, a square is generally a square, a circle is generally a circle, but the apple, some students said apple, some students said heart. It didn't matter to me what they called it as long as it was consistent and I knew what they meant. There are two um, tools that uh, I used and were really good and phenomenal. They are the LEA symbols and number charts from Good Lights. Uh, they are available both in numbers and shapes. So they work for all populations, even if they're not reading yet. And distance acuity and discrimination is very similar. You want to start at the furthest normed distance on the tool that you are using and move closer if necessary. Be sure to document the actual distance that they were able to read each line at. And once again, review those shapes so you know what they are calling them before you start. I do want to let you know that the normed, um, the normed distance on whatever tool you used is very accurate. If you are using one that's normed at a three foot distance, it is just as accurate as one that is normed at 10 or 20 feet. The ones pictured on the page are the LEA symbols and numbers from Good Light for distance. Depth perception. This is a great area to assess um, with observation. It is the ability for eyes to team together to detect depth and dimension. Strategies for assessing this include 
asking the student to identify which of two objects is closer or further away. Observe how the student reaches for materials, grasps, places, and releases items. Are they overreaching? Are they underreaching? Assess if the student uses eye-hand coordination to place, to place puzzle pieces in inset puzzles. That's great for the younger kids. Observe student reaction to changes in walking surfaces. If you're doing an observation at outside, um, how are they going from the sidewalk to mulch or the sidewalk to uh, grass? You'd also want to try and observe them on stairs. Sometimes easier said than done in Florida. We don't have a lot of stairs in Florida, but most schools do have them somewhere. Uh, some of the areas I liked to make sure I tried to observe students for depth perception are pictured on this page. They include um, at the top left, a curb. Can the students see a curb coming up? Um, are they aware that they're about to go into the street? Uh, or do they know that it's coming up, but they're, something's coming up, but they're not sure, so they feel with their foot ahead of time? Uh, I know a lot of my students really struggled in parking lots with those concrete parking barriers. Um, these are painted, so there is some contrast, but not all of them are. Can they see them with contrast and without? Uh, it really depends on what you have access to. There's a playground scene with mulch, sidewalks, and grass, and then, of course, the stairs. The last section of the functional vision assessment is the contrast sensitivity. It is the ability to see differences in the brightness of symbols or in objects around, against their background. Um, you want to try and do some formal and informal assessing in this area. Uh, pictured on the page is the contrast sensitivity, sensitivity booklet and it is a wonderful resource. I would also use uh, colored markers on the whiteboard in the classroom. I would use different colors because teachers love to make things interesting for students and they use all kinds of different colors, but that doesn't mean our students can see all those different colors. Some students struggle with the lighter colors like yellow and orange. Also, uh, teachers like to use them till they die because budgets, it's hard to replace things, but our students may struggle to see them as they are wearing out and as they are not as dark and crisp. Additionally, if the whiteboard hasn't been cleaned well and it's got all that gunk on it that's distorting the image and giving that background, are they able to see it or do they need more of a crisp contrast with a clear whiteboard. All very valuable information within a classroom setting. This was the last section of the functional vision assessment. Um, I do want to let you know that if you are interested in any of the um, more formal assessments that I showed in this section, you can email me and I will provide you with ordering information. Um, any district that participates in our quality programs for the visually impaired does receive all of these resources for free as part of that training. We are currently taking requests for this program for the 22-23 school year. So if you and your district are um, interested in that, please email me. I can give you additional information on the program. Um, feel free to contact me anytime. All of my uh, contact information is on the last slide in this PowerPoint. So just to wrap things up, this is one of my favorite quotes about the functional vision assessment. The functional vision assessment is a combination of art and science. The science refers to the technical aspects of the assessment process. Art is involved in the keen observation interpretation and synthesis of the students' visual skills and the engineering of the appropriate environment, adaptations and programming to meet the resulting needs.
before we move on to learning media assessments, Liz, were there any questions on the functional vision portion? So there were no questions. There was a comment from Andrea um, talking about peripheral field back in the beginning of the section that she would have the O&M instructor help with uh, the peripheral field assessment, and it was very informational for both of them. And I nice. wholeheartedly agree with that suggestion. That's a great suggestion. Yes. And uh -huh. I I just threw a comment in the chat talking about the stairs. I taught orientation mobility, so I know how much of a challenge that was. If your school has a multi-purpose room with the stage, then there are stairs somewhere in that room. Um, sometimes <laughs> even just using a curb could give you some information too. Um, and the one other suggestion I wanted to throw out there was talking about those um, dry erase markers. So if your student needs those dark dry erase markers, give that teacher at the beginning of the school year the gifts of a box of dry erase markers. <laughs> Make it easy for them to do what they need to do for your student. <laughs> Love those. Those are great suggestions. <laughs> okay, so if nobody else has any questions, we are going to continue on. Ooh, I think I'm doing pretty good on time. Yes. So here we go. The next area is the learning media assessment. What is a learning media assessment? It is an objective process of systematically selecting the most appropriate learning or instructional materials and methods, as well as the literacy media, reading and writing in print and or braille. It is a series of observations and assessments to determine primary, secondary, or tertiary sensory channels for accessing learning materials. So what does the LMA assess? It assesses a, a, stu a student's learning style or the way in which the senses are used, vision, touch, hearing, either singularly or in combination to access information and learn. It indicates the use of the sensory channel by the student. It helps determine the most efficient learning media for that student. It provides indicators of readiness for literacy programming for our students. It helps us initially select the best learning media for our student. And as we continue to assess it over the years, it helps us maintain and ensure that they are continuing to be using the literacy medium that works best for them because it can change for students over time. It also incorporates literacy tool inventory. So what are the components of the LMA? It includes current print functioning, basic reading inventory, which includes oral reading, silent reading, listening, and reading stamina. It also includes computer, um, computer, computer monitoring, the computer monitor and access. And you need to look, especially for students that may be using this computer-based testing. And finally, near and distance components for reading and writing. So in the area of current media functioning, this is an, there is an emphasis on determining students' primary and secondary sensory channels. This assessment area provides a structured data collection format for determining a student's primary and secondary sensory learning channels, types of general learning media the student uses or will use to accomplish those learning tasks, literacy media the student will use for reading and writing. When assessing in this area, the TVI should pay particular attention to font size, type of paper, contrast, again, of materials, use of optical devices, dome magnifier, video magnifier, monocular, lighting conditions, and use of hands. So you can see how some of the components 
in the functional vision will help you with the learning media as well. Not every child learns primarily through visual or tactile means. Gestatory, auditory, and kinesthetic skills can be an important mode of learning for students with additional disabilities. Information gathered in this area should also be inventoried and evaluate learning media found in the student's home, classroom, and other learning environments. So how would you go about doing this? I have some tools for you. Um, the first one is a sensory channel tool. It is from the learning media assessment uh, of students with visual impairments. There is a clickable link in the PowerPoint for you. It is a very simple form where you jot down the behavior that you're observing, and then you just circle the sensory avenue that the student utilized when completing that task. The next sensory learning tool is from one of my favorite books, uh, The Essential Tools of the Trade. It is uh, one of the most recent and relevant books because it was, uh, it was published in 2018, so it is very recent. It has this wonderful form included in it. Um, it also comes with a, uh, a thumb drive, so you can download all of these forms and print them as you need them. You jot down the observed behavior, and then you circle the sensory channel. Uh, this one, this form only has visual, tactile, and auditory uh, channels that you're um, noting. So there's two great tools for sensory channels. When you are looking for learning media and how the students are using them uh, within a classroom or school setting, the FEMLA book is available in our loan library. Um, and it has wonderful forms that are easily used and checklists to see how a student is accessing information in their environment and in their school setting. Another tool is once again from Essential Tools of the Trade, and it has um, distance and near items to it. And you just circle how the student is accessing that information. Very quick and easy to use. Moving on to functional near reading and writing skills. These are observations of classroom tasks are documented and work samples are collected to determine the functional reading and writing demands of the classroom. This information is used to evaluate the student's current performance in comparison with their sighted peers. Near assessment, near and distant assessment measures address access and technology needed to complete tasks, time needed to copy from the board, from their books, from handouts, how fast and accurately can they read their own handwriting, um, any sort of ACC or augmentative communication device, what is their engagement with that like, and how is it com um, comparable to their peers? So some everyday distance activities that you may want to be sure to incorporate into your LMA include, uh, but are not limited to, rulers and measuring tapes. Whew, the numbers on those can be teeny tiny and they are required in a lot of math classes. Wall clocks, watches, um, what are their preferred tablet settings and the reading distance for those tablets? Can they visually access wall posters and at what distance? Are they able to see the TV and smart board within their classrooms and at what distance? Can they read street signs and exit signs? Or do they need some tools to help them with that? Monoculars come to mind. Restaurant menus, both handheld and wall mounted, those big boards behind the counter at uh, the fast food restaurants, can they see and access those? Monoculars may help with that as well. Food packaging, nutrition labels, very important information on all of those labels, but they do tend to be very small. Can they access them or do they need a tool like a dome magnifier to assist with that? Important skills for independent functioning. 
and if they um, are using any sort of communication symbols or augmentative and alternate communication devices. What size do the symbols or pictures need to be in order for them to access that information and use it most efficiently? Reading and listening skills come next. Informal reading inventory assesses grade level reading, words read per minute, reading comprehension levels, and listening comprehension levels. So the reading and listening skills include, during this assessment, it is the foundation for successful access of the general education curriculum. An informal reading inventory should document students' performance in several appropriate mediums, regular print, large print, Braille, regular print with optical devices, such as dome magnifiers or video magnifiers, computers and or tablet, tablets, just to name a few. Eye fatigue and stamina can be evaluated by completing an extended reading inventory for 20 minutes or more at various times of the day. The student may do better in the morning, but as reading demands uh, compile, for each of their classes during the day, by the end of the day, they may have a lot of fatigue and um, stamina issues. When assessing a students that are reading below grade level, it's always best practice to determine what the student's independent reading level is before you start the assessment. You can speak with the classroom teacher to help with this or begin with a word list. You wanna make sure that you are testing the student on the appropriate grade level. You don't want to frustrate them before you even begin by asking them to read something that may be too hard or difficult for them. A lot of times students will just shut down if that happens and you won't get accurate information. When you are completing a basic reading inventory, consistency is key. You want to make sure that every single piece that you are assessing is on that student's independent reading level. You want to make sure that you are comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. There is an example on the page that shows that a student was assessed on their independent reading level, which was the seventh grade level in all areas, regular print, large print, and regular print with a magnifier. If you are assessing them on their independent reading level in all areas, then you assure that you are testing their access to the media and not their ability to read. If you are using different grade levels for those assessments, you won't get an accurate result. You won't know if you're testing their um, reading media or uh, if they do better or worse because of the level that they're being asked to read. You also want to assess them on access technology. And once again, use that same independent reading level. So you know that you're assessing the actual media itself and not the reading skills. So in this case, they used um, seventh grade with Zoom text and then seventh grade with FSA settings. Computer-based testing um, and digital samples. You can also, uh, something that is missing from this page and the last page are tablets. A lot of our students are doing a lot of reading on tablets now, which works great for them because um, they can make it the size that they need it to and they have easy access to those accommodations. But you do want to document what size is preferred? What contrast are they using? Do they need gestures or voiceover? Those types of things. Reading stamina and visual fatigue. This is one of the hardest and most time consuming areas to assess. To be perfectly honest, it was my least favorite section, um, but I do have some tips that may make it a little bit easier for you. 
So the procedures that I used, um, time the student in five minute increments for at least 20 minutes. You need an extended period of time for this. You want to note where the student began and finished each reading section. Then you count the number of words read, divide by five, and that gives you the words per minute. You want to also note while the student's reading if there are any visual behaviors, such as squinting, rubbing eyes, moving the re reading materials either closer as time goes on or further away. For students with normal vision, reading speed typically increases as they progress. They become familiar with the, uh, what they're reading and they become more interested in it. Uh, when visual fatigue is present, reading speed will decrease, especially in the last five to 10 minutes. Assessing fatigue and stamina is especially important when conducting assessments on students with documented diagnosis of convergence insufficiency or binocular vision deficits. This is where they, you will find a lot of, um, they have a lot of difficulties with stamina and fatigue, and they may need some accommodations in that area. So some resources to help make this area a little bit easier for you. Um, there are longer passages available in the Qualitative Reading Inventory 6. I always used Bookshare when assessing reading stamina for several reasons. Um, you could download high interest chapter books always on the student's reading inventory, uh, independent reading level. We've been over that every section, students in independent reading level. Um, they are available in both DAISY uh, and that has the pictures for the students where they're available and then Word for me because I would have the students read mark on my word copy where they started, where they stopped for each section. Then if you highlight those sections, Word counts those numbers for you. If not, it's very time consuming to have to count all the numbers in the page. Um, you can also then use that same book that you've downloaded. You can print it out. You can print it out in large print. You can use it on a computer. And you can also use it on a tablet to assess reading stamina in those areas as well. Although testing fatigue when using a device is not a required component of an FEMLA, whatever reading method the student is expected to use in class and in life should be assessed. If the student complains of eye strain or gets frequent headaches, visual fatigue would be useful information to document. The recent increase in technology um, due to COVID has made this even more and more evident. I would recommend testing fatigue using whatever primary reading medium you find is most appropriate for the students when completing your learning media assessments. I have also provided you with additional resources. These are clickable links on the bottom um, there's one on procedures for determining performance and stamina with different sized print. And there's assessing the student, the reading speed and stamina of students with low vision. And it also has a video that is, accompanies that one. So these are cl clickable links. So if you download the PowerPoint, you will have access to them. Braille. Braille must be addressed on every functional vision learning media assessment. It must also be addressed on every IEP as stated in IDEA. You need to clearly establish why Braille is or is not being taught. If they are learning Braille, where are they in that Braille process? Are they able to use any devices such as the one shown a refreshable Braille display. All very important information to keep and document within your learning media assessment. So some of the tools um, that you can use to determine learning media are very different depending on the type of student that you are assessing. Students that are academic or dual media students 
You can use things such as the John's basic reading inventory, the, Fint the Flint Cooter comprehensive reading inventory, and the qualitative reading inventory. These are all books with passages, comprehension questions, um, and very specific valid reliable tools for um, testing reading, um, uh, reading inventories. We have all of them in our loan library, so you can um, check them out on our website if you like. I found I always needed more than one because when you are doing all of those assessments, large print, regular print, tablets, um, uh, oral, listening, silent reading, it takes a lot of passages. And you want to use passages that students have not seen before. You don't want to repeat passages. And sometimes for our students that are struggling readers, even in three years, they may be on the same passages. So you wanna try and use different passages each time. So there are three resources for you to get a large number of passages. Um, there is also a fairly new uh, resource, which is the PAR. It is downloadable from a website. It is free. You do have to um, sign up for it, but it had great passages in it that were Word documents. So it's a wonderful resource to print out in different font sizes. And you can also uh, copy and paste it into Duxbury or a Braille translation program so that you can emboss them and use them when you are assessing your Braille students. If you have students with multiple impairments, the sensory learning kit is the perfect tool for you. It has all of the pieces and it comes with a great book that will guide you through all of those steps. Also available from our learning library. Okay, there are some new tools out there in the last few years. Um, there is one for students with CVI from Visio. It is the Visual Assessment Scale. It is online, my favorite, free, downloadable. It is an objective and standardized assessment of visual development of children with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities, which monitors the development and provides the possibility to register progress and measure the effect of intervention. So it's good for assessment and to measure it um, to see how your interventions are doing along the way. Some other new tools from APH include the decision-making guide. It is a guide to print size selection that provides an easy formula to determine the most appropriate print size. There are, um, it, it's very interesting and I'm going to warn you if you order it and it comes to you, it has lots and lots of pages to it, but they are all individual pages. Um, so the one that we use in the office, we punched holes into and put it into a binder to make it much easier to use and access, but it has a large number of uh, pages, both sentences and passages to use. So it's a great new resource. Also new from APH is the Baraga Visual Efficiency Program. It, ev it evaluates the visual efficiency of students with low vision who achieved cognitive developmental skills at or beyond the three-year-old level. Um, it starts with actual real objects and then moves to things like in the picture with the um, two-dimensional pictures. It also starts with real pictures and then moves to drawings. So it's a really good to measure uh, where a student is at in their visual efficiency. When you are assessing computer display preferences, there is a wonderful resource and website from the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. It describes how to customize different web browsers and their displays. It gives you e-reader display options. And it also talks about read aloud or text-to-speech features on various devices. 
I have included the link here for you that you can use if you need to. Another great resource for assessing computer preferences and display options is our Florida Statewide Assessment website. There are computer-based practice tests for you to use with your student to see, can they use the scroll bars? A lot of times my students had a really hard time scrolling up and down when they needed to. Were they able to see on the computer screen if they were taking a math test, for example, the decimal places, the exponents, um, what size does it need to be? Can they follow the mouse and found, find the mouse when they need it? Um, if they need paper-based, this will give you the documentation and the data you need to support those accommodations. Any student who will be participating in computer-based testing definitely needs to do this section. When you are assessing Braille literacy skills, UEB, it does come in eBay also, but none of our students should be using eBay at this time. We have fully transitioned to UEB, but there is a wonderful assessment of Braille literacy skills. It focuses on literacy, not just on the Braille code. It is a multifaceted approach. It is ongoing, so you can use it over time. It has a meaningful integration of both assessment and instructional processes. So it gives you ideas. We do have it in our loan library and it is divided into three sections, emergent literacy, academic literacy, which is reading and writing, and then functional literacy. Some other resources that you can use are free downloads. Um, the first one is a Braille literacy checklist. It is from teaching students with visual impairments. It is quick and easy to use. And I used it over time. Um, this is one that I used, I printed it out. And then as students were learning them, um, I could check them off. Or if they were dual media users, they could check them off um, to see their progress. It, um, there is a link at the bottom of the page for easy access. Another checklist that is wonderful and is free to download is from the Braille Authority of North America or, or BANA. Um, and there is a link to that one on the bottom of the page as well. So that completes our learning media section of the FVMLA. Are there any questions on this section before we move forward? Um, so we do have one question and some comments. So I'll put the, the comments out here first. So um, we had our, our folks from the Florida Low Vision Initiative in the chat, Tanoy and Kim. Um, Tanoy was pointing out that, yeah, thank you for including the optical devices and reading stamina is so important to be assessing. So that's exactly, we agree. That's why we make sure to include it in mm -hmm. trainings like this. Um, Kim Roberts said that the Florida Low Vision Initiative is accepting new students, which is great news. So if you have Fantastic. students who would benefit from a low vision evaluation and free devices and support and all that good stuff, um, Kim Roberts, her email is in the chat, kmroberts at fsu.edu for more information about them. And um, I'm just looking at a comment from Jeff Schwartz. So when assessing visual fatigue, I like to evaluate students at the end of their day, assuming they've been actively engaged in school. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Because that's going to be the hardest time for them. They've had to use their eyes all day long. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then so the question we had from Teresa regarding the informal reading inventory, if a student does not speak English, should the inventory be presented in the student's native language and report results noting it was presented in the specific language? Ooh. That is a great question. Um, you definitely, I would say definitely yes, if you have access to that, because if not, you're probably not going to get accurate information. You won't know if the student is actually not seeing it or if they're not able to 
read it because they don't understand it because it's in their name. It's not in their native language. Mm -hmm. So definitely maybe work with your ESOL teacher. This is where a team approach would be very beneficial because they may be able to help you with that also. But definitely, if you're not doing it in the student's native language, you're, you won't be sure that you're getting accurate results on the functional vision, on the learning media functional vision piece. It may just be a lack of understanding because of the language barrier. Yeah. So yeah, great and I, question. Yeah. Yeah. And I completely agree with what you're saying. Cause yeah, otherwise you don't, you don't know what level the student's at. You have, yeah, mm -hmm. you're missing all kinds of information. And so Jeff Schwartz was agreeing with that, that he would assess in both the native language and English when appropriate. So if the student knows some English, then that's something that can be added as well. And... Absolutely. And I definitely agree with the low vision initiative. I had um, a number of students that went through the low vision initiative and uh, were given devices that were so perfectly appropriate for them. Um, and it was a huge benefit and asset. So if you do have those students that would benefit from a low vision evaluation, please contact them, um, Kim or Tanoy. It's a phenomenal program. Yes, yeah, we agree. And there is, if you, um, another thing that you can do if you're not familiar with them, they did a webinar uh, with us back at the beginning of the school year that is archived mm. on our website, I believe under the statewide resources section past event. So you can check that out as well. Um, but emailing them might be the easiest option too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and oh, and they have a live binders page. Yes, yes yeah, that they do. is a fabulous resource with all yes, kinds of wonderful is. information. It's got great ideas for um, uh, dome magnifier activities, monocular activities. I used to use their live binder all the time. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, yes, Kim, so if you, could put that live binders information in the chat. That would be awesome. Cause I, I think I remember there being a code that you have to enter to access it. So if that's an option to share with people, that would be fabulous to put in the chat. Okay. All right. I think we're good with question for now. Okay. Okay. We're going to move on to the next section. Can you guess what it is? the Expanded Core Competencies, or ECC. Now we're getting down to brass tacks. Oh, one of my favorite ECC quotes. As professionals, we are ethically responsible to give students the opportunity to gain success in the ECC, to gain skills in the ECC, so that they have the opportunity to live up to their potential. Students deserve nothing less. These are the specialized skills that we teach. These are the standards that we as um, teachers of students with visual impairments uh, have and the skills that we teach when we're working with students. And there are nine of them. These are all of the areas that have been proven to be impacted by a vision loss. They include compensatory skills, orientation and mobility, social interactions, independent living, rec and leisure skills, sensory efficiency, assistive technology, career education, and self-determination. And if you are a TBI or working in our field, you probably know all about these, but just in case we have others on board today, I'm going to briefly go over each one of them. So the first area in the expanded core competencies is compensatory skills. These are the vital competencies required to be functional in school, including basic concept development, listening skills, organizational skills, specialized communication skills, such as reading and writing braille or tactile graphics. Career education are tools and knowledge needed to obtain and retain employment. Unfortunately, um, uh, our field uh, visual impairments is one of the lowest employed disability areas out there. 
if not the lowest. And we are really working hard to change that. Um, so we want them to not only be able to obtain jobs, but we want to be at them to be successful in those jobs and retain them. You all, we also want to give them an understanding of suitable careers for them. The next area is assistive technology, and this is an ever-growing and changing area. It is the ability to use devices, computers, and other electronic equipment to perform independently and successfully at school, work, or home. I know a lot of times when we think of assistive technology, we always tend to think of high tech, such as computers and tablets, but also in this area can be low tech devices which can make our, our students successful in class and in life, such as signature guides or highlighting strips. So we wanna think high tech and low tech when we are thinking assistive technology. Independent living. These are the daily living skills needed to function as independently as possible, including personal care, household operations, eating techniques, time management, and financial knowledge. If we get students through school and they academically succeed, but do not have the independent living skills to live independently and take care of themselves, then they will not have the skills required to become employed and live independently successful lives. So we want to work on those independent living skills at whatever level they're at to make them as independent as they can be. Self-determination, understanding of their visual impairment to advocate for themselves based on individually identified accommodations and objectives. We are determining those um, accommodations that they need by doing our FAMLAs, but they need to have a good understanding of what they are and why they need them as well. Because once they leave us, once they graduate and move on, they no longer have anybody there to be their voice for them. They have to learn to do that on their own. We want to work ourselves out of a job and make them independent. Moving on, social skills, learning how to behave and participate actively in social situations without the benefit of visual cues, such as facial expressions or gestures. That can make communication very difficult, especially with peers, when they don't have those same cues that their sighted peers have. Sensory efficiency is utilizing all of their senses, including whatever functional vision they may have, hearing, touch, taste, and smell in the most efficient manner possible, plus using optical aids or alternate, alternative communication devices when appropriate. That can be the monocular, the dome magnifier, things like that. Orientation and mobility is not only travel skills. I know when I think of orientation and mobility, that's the first thing that pops into my head, but it is also knowing where they are in space as well as travel skills to move independently, effectively and safely within their environment. Also using mobility devices such as the white cane if needed. And the last but not least, rec and leisure area. Exploring hobbies and physical activities to learn about following rules, turn-taking skills, and decision-making. They need to learn how to spend their free time and try and get them as active as possible. So those are the nine areas we are um, required to teach and assess, how do we go about that? The ECC assessment process can be done in steps. Step one, evaluate the student needs. Once again, when you're looking through those records, review them, complete observations and interviews. I would get so much valuable information from my interviews about their ECC skills. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Step two, assess all areas. We are required to assess all nine areas when we are completing our FBMLAs. 
you want to prioritize the domains for deeper assessment. Step three would be focusing on any areas of priority using valid and reliable tools. Once again, that, those valid and reliable tools, and I will give you examples. Um, we cannot always uh, teach and could not be expected to teach online areas every day, every year, every week. That's why you need to find the ones that are priority and focus on those. We are very lucky because we generally get our students for a longer period of time, generally from age three until they age out. So between um, those 12, 13, 14 years, we should be able to hit all of the ECC areas and make them as independent as possible. So expanded core competency assessments. You want to conduct the assessment in each of those nine areas. Complete a deep dive into high priority areas to develop data to support goals and objectives. You wanna identify behaviors and our skills where instruction is needed in order to obtain or maintain mastery. We are required to account for current and future needs. We are one of the few programs that is required to do that. The next one is one of the hardest ones, but it is also one of the most important ones. Establish if the vision loss or condition is directly impacting those areas where there is a deficit. Sometimes students have deficits in areas and it's not a result of their vision loss. It could be a result of something else, such as a learning disability or cognitive impairment. This is one of the hardest things to determine. Is it the vision? Is it something else? That's where a team can be widely beneficial. Use your team, your IEP team, to help make those decisions. And finally, determine the priority needs for special instruction in the next one to three years. So what are some technically sound instruments that you can use? Um, we have two of them that are available in our loan library. They are the assessment and ongoing evaluations from independent living. We also have the evals kit, which is very comprehensive and thorough, all of which are technically sound. There is also the student performance indicators. It was one of my favorite because it's an online resource. So I could download it and print out just the pages I needed based on the age or ability level of each of my students. If you have a student that is young in early childhood or with multiple, dis multiple impairments, the Oregon Project is the tool for you. It is one of the few if not only tools that I used when I first graduated from college more than 30 years ago, that is still very relevant today. Uh, they have kept it updated. It is in its sixth edition. I believe they are working on a seventh, but it is not available at this time. But it is one of the very few tools that was actually developed with our population in mind. It was made for students with a visual impairment or blindness. It's also uh, very easy to use. It's a checklist booklet um, and you can use it for multiple assessments over multiple periods and times and years because it's built right into the assessment. It's a great piece. an ECC must have is the ECC essentials, teaching the expanded core curriculum for students with visual impairments. It is a fantastic book by Carol B. Allman and Sandra Lewis. We do have it in our loan library. If you need it, please order it. It helps with assessment as well as um, instructional strategies, ideas, and skills. It is a fabulous resource. And like I mentioned earlier, one really phenomenal way of gathering information in the ECC areas is through your interviews. I know in the um, district I worked in previously, 
we decided that we were not getting enough ECC information. Um, and so we revamped and revised our interview questions for both teachers and parents. And we added a lot of questions in them on ECC skills because the parents know better than anything anyone, how they're doing at home, how they're functioning independently, and what they're doing in that environment. Teachers can tell you what kids are doing independently when you're not there, because that can look very different. Um, kids would suddenly pull out their tools and start using them when I walked in the door, but the teachers would let me know that that wasn't happening when I wasn't there, things like that. So um, I suggest you maybe look at your interview questions and add or revise them to help with these areas. Um, here, there are some examples on the page. How does your child perform daily living activities in the following areas? Personal hygiene, eating, dressing, rec and leisure. How does your child's visual impairment impact him or her in community activities, such as socially, eating out, attending movies? Does your child complete homework independently? Are there any issues relating to completing homework. These are just a few examples to kind of get you thinking. This wraps up our ECC section. Are there any questions or comments, Liz? So no, question, so no questions. We do have a comment from Andrea Wallace. They're um, saying there are many, there are so many AT skills that can be assessed in your LMA. And I will just let you know that Andrea Wallace is our resident assistive technology expert. So if you ever need ideas on um, what to do in those assessments, please do feel free to reach out to Andrea. Absolutely. <laughs> She's my go-to for all things tech related, for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I must be doing pretty good if there if we're not getting a lot of questions. <laughs> I I think so. Your this information is fantastic. It's very clear and um, understandable and so helpful. There's so much okay. information here, so many resources. Okay. So I well, think people are just taking it all in and absorbing it, and they're probably thinking, ooh. I need to go order that or ooh, I need to <laughs> change that. Nope. Okay, well, we are going to proceed on then. We're doing really good on time. So we probably, we may have some um, extra time at the end for questions and comments. So we will open it up at that time. But before we do that, our final section is on <clears throat> orientation and mobility, screenings and assessments. So this has changed in recent years. Our state board rule changed in 2017 and it added orientation and mobility screenings or assessments as a component for all initial and three year re-evaluations. Um, that did happen in 2017. They did not make it retroactive, which meant you didn't have to go back and do that um, but you did need to complete them from that point forward. It has now been more than three years since that was enacted. So at this time, all of our students should have either an orientation and mobility screening or assessment. Screenings may be conducted by a teacher of the visually impaired or by an orientation and mobility instructor. Orientation and mobility instructors are the only ones that can complete the assessments. The purpose is to determine the need for a referral for an orientation and mobility assessment. We are required to do them at any evaluation, but they may be done at other times. You may want to consider doing an O&M screening if um, the student has never been evaluated for O&M. If the student has had a change in their vision, you may want to complete one. They usually are quick and easy and you can do them um, uh, within no time and it will give you some very valuable information. If the student is transitioning to a new school or a different set of expectations. And finally, if the student is approaching high school and will not be driving, very important they receive those orientation and mobility skills before they graduate. So there are a number of screening tools 
that you may want to consider and or use. I have listed five of them on the page for you with clickable links. Um, there is the EVS, Educational Vision Services, Orientation Mobility Screening, an O&M checklist from the Texas School for the Blind, the Michigan Severity Rating Scale, the Oregon Project, and one of the most thorough and best ones, the TAP. So those are all clickable links that you can use um, to help you pick a screening tool. Please remember that when you are picking a tool or if you are creating one for your district, there are some components you want to make sure to include. You want to focus on functional performance of the student in all environments. What is their visual functioning in school, on the playground, and when traveling? Any sort of environmental conditionings that might affect their functioning. Um, some kids do better on rainy days because it's not as bright, um, but they may really struggle on bright sunny days. What are their travel needs? Will they be driving? If not, they will need to learn how to get where they're going um, by other means. Parent input should always be included. We need to look at their future needs. If they have a progressive loss, they will definitely need orientation and mobility training along the way. And will the student need to travel out in the community? All of these are great components to include in your checklist or your screening. Some screenings are yes and no checklists um, for each task, skill, or behavior. Some of them are rating scales for the quality or travel performance and behaviors. I've given you a few additional resources and samples on this page that are also clickable links for you to use. Okay. I believe we have gone through all of the sections of assessments for FBMLAs. Take a deep breath. Um, so this is a great time. If you've thought of any questions, if you, you have any further questions, um, please, if you have suggestions, do you have things that work well for you that I didn't have? Uh, this is a great opportunity to share, share with your colleagues. I always love to learn about new things, new ideas, new methods. Mm -hmm. Please put them in your chat box. I am going to um, open up the chat box so I can monitor it now. Okay. And yes, you did You did get some kudos from Jeff Schwartz. He said, you are amazing. And I wholeheartedly agree. Um, the So the ECC Essentials book that you mentioned, so that is an APH product. Mm -hmm. If you are in Florida, I believe we still have quite a number of copies of that book sitting on our shelves in our loan library. So you do not need to go buy that yourself. Submit a loan library request to us and we will send you one of those copies. Absolutely. Um, one thing I did want to mention, because we just talked about orientation mobility, I wanted to make sure um, people realize if you're in Florida that th that state board rule change. So when you're doing an initial eligibility evaluation, you have to do a screening. And so then if the student is receiving orientation mobility, that means it's a three year reeval, you have to do an orientation mobility assessment. So once that student is receiving orientation mobility, now you're doing assessments, you're not doing screenings at that point, just to make sure there's no confusion. Great. Right. Thank you, Liz. Absolutely. Okay, yes, we have some other people agreeing with us. Thank you for this webinar. Great job, lots of awesome information. Um, and this this was a lot of information. And I I know many of us who went through the FSU program or other university programs, this was a semester course <laughs> to learn <laughs> about all of this. So this is such a great resource that people will have, I think, especially just thinking about what different tools they can use that maybe they weren't aware of, especially new things or different ways and strategies of assessing the different areas um, of the FBLMA. But I, I do want to make sure people know too that this, this 
there's a lot here, but obviously there's more to it than just this. We didn't talk about, you know, recommendations or report writing, any of that. And if you are in a district that is not participating in the quality program for students with visual impairment program, so that's QPVI, that's the abbreviation, and you would like to dive deeper into this type of thing, then you need to reach out to Sherry and get your district on that list for next school year, because that's where you really get the opportunity to um, look at your district procedures for this whole process, um, make sure you're, you know, doing high quality assessments and reports and all that good stuff. And I can let you talk about that, Sherry. You're the one. <laughs> yes. So we do. We do all of that and more. So this I condensed. This is a three day training when you're in um, QPVI with me. You get all of the resources and everything. Um, they're provided for free. Uh, it is one of uh, the seven components of QPVI, but we do spend a lot of times a full day on each of these areas. And like Liz said, in school, this is an entire semester course. So um, I try to condense it down into two hours for all of you, but uh, there is a lot more out there. So if you are interested in QPVI for next year, um, I can send you information uh, that tells you all about it. I can answer any of your questions. Um, my contact information is at the end of the PowerPoint, so we will get to that. Uh, feel free to contact me at any time. Yay, awesome. Yes, okay. more people saying thank you, Sherry. Yay. You So <laughs> uh, there are some additional resources at the end, um, and they are listed, and some of them have links. I'm going to let Liz take over with the evaluation portion. Yes. Okay. So if you could go ahead before we give you the closing code for this webinar, if you could do an evaluation for us, these are four questions. If you've done our webinars before, you recognize these questions. Um, and so you can use the QR code on this page or the, um, the link is also at the top of the events page on our website. I will say that our evaluation form will be changing at some point to have different questions. So if at some point you go in there and like, hey, these are not those four questions I recognize. Um, they will be changing at some point to be determined. So, but if you could go ahead and fill that out for us so we have some feedback and we make sure that we are meeting your needs. We'll leave that okay. there for a moment so people yes. can grab that. <clears throat> Oh, I wonder if I can drop the link into the chat box. That's a great idea. Thank you, Sherry. Let's see. Yeah, and it, we do have the bit.ly here too, but of course it's always, you don't see the course on the list. So I will double check. Uh -huh. Maybe it's, maybe I neglected to add that. I will <laughs> check that in a moment here. Um, but just so you know that that link, you can go back and you will find it at the top of the event page on our website. If it's not there, if you could go back and revisit that, I'll double check to see if it's on there or not. Um, do not see the course. Okay. All right. So I apologize for that. I will take care of that probably immediately after we sign off here. Um, and then to our next slide. Okay, so our next slide. So if you are looking for credit, and hopefully, I think I do need to go check because hopefully this is on that form, but your closing code that you are looking for, if you want ACV or AP or in-service credit or both, is going to be quality. Quality. And so you're going to find this training on that form, if it's there, hopefully it is and um, fill out the form, put in your email address and a certificate will be emailed back to you. If you don't get a certificate within a day or so, something went wrong on the back end. So then get in touch with me or um, anyone else at FIMC and we will get that resolved for you. But I'm gonna go ahead and look I don't, no one told me yet that it's not there, but I kind of want to check and see if it is there on that form. So while you're doing that, Liz, okay. um, uh, 
We did want to talk about some of our upcoming trainings at FIMC. We do have a number of them coming up. The Florida Standards Assessment Webinar, we do this every year. It is with Kathy Kompowski and it is phenomenal. Um, it is going to be next week, January 13th. Then we have in March on the 24th, our next virtual water cooler. It's one of many in this series this year, and it is going to be on IEP goals and objectives, specifically for students with visual impairments. On March 31st, we are going to be doing our third and final FIMC information updates webinar, and it will talk about closing procedures for the end of the year. On April 8th, we are going to have, um, I think it's 8th and 9th, it's going to be our spring joint vision um, and DHH contacts meeting. Um, it is now going to be virtual. We were hoping to do it in person, but uh, it looks like we may be moving finally our facilities in April, and um, that was just too much to do in one month. So it will be virtual and will be on the 8th and 9th. Our final water cooler of the year is on orientation and mobility. And you are going to want to keep an eye on that on our website because we are working on getting a fabulous guest speaker for that one, um, but we don't have it locked down just yet. So um, I'm not gonna announce it, but keep that in mind. And um, towards the end of April, we have our final working with the experts it's going to be virtual and it is um, on augmentative communication devices for students with visual impairments. And um, I have heard the speaker before, he is wonderful. Uh, the links are on our events page for you to sign up for all of these events uh, because of the move and uh, speaker uh, things that happen. Um, these are the dates that we have right now, but they may be subject to change <laughs> uh, if we need to, which is a lot easier to do when they are virtual. Um, yes, and the nice thing is if you register for um, one of our virtual trainings on Zoom and we happen to need to change the date for any reason, you will get a notification of that fact. So you wouldn't need to be checking back constantly to see if that happens or not. Um, I am trying to add this training to the form, but it's being very slow, possibly because everyone's in it right now trying to do that. So I will be sure to add that as soon as I can get this working, but it will be called Overview of Essential Assessments for Students with Visual Impairments, and I'll make sure it's at the top of that list for both this and the evaluation. Um, there are some other trainings that you all may have heard about at some point that are not listed here. So um, we're, we're kind of working on other things, but I also wanted to say that you'll notice we're, we kind of have a theme going through all of this. We earlier in the year had an initial eligibility and reevaluation webinar. Here we're talking about assessment. Um, we had this IEP goals and objectives thing coming up. And so now we're also um, planning on probably early next school year doing a webinar on data collection. So just kind of all of those pieces of um, services for students with visual impairment. So we're trying to make sure um, everyone has the most up-to-date information and resources and all of that good stuff. So keep an eye on the event page of our website for any new things that we add. Absolutely. Okay, and and that brings us to our very last page, which are all of the ways that you can keep in touch with us. Uh, my email is listed at the very end, but we do have our address, our phone numbers. If you are not on our wait mailing list, you can sign up for that here. We have a website. Um, we have a Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channels. We also have a Canvas page. So there's a link to the sign up form for that. Lots of ways that you can keep in touch with us. Okay. All right, I am going to 